Good morning, I'm Xander Robertson and I'm nine years old. Good morning, I'm Braylon Robertson and I'm nine years old. Welcome to Wrightsville UNC's Children's Sabbath Worship Service. We sure do miss worshiping with all you in person. We hope we can get back together soon. Here are the announcements for this week. The church is hosting a talent show called Hey Wrightsville, Look at Me. We know lots of you were practicing for games that are not being played, recitals that are not being danced, concerts and plays that are not being performed, a myriad of other things that you've been working on. We were heartbroken for you too. Until we realized the show must go on. Your church family is ready to be your biggest fan. Show us what you've got. We're excited to see your talent and Celebrate all of your hard work. This talent show is for kids and adults alike. So bring it on. Right slow UMC. We can't wait. This is a Facebook event. Please keep videos to a cameo of appearance. Upload all videos submission to our event page on Facebook. Right slow United Methodist Church. Join Romans 12, 12. Join us at 12, 12 every day as we pray for an end to COVID-19 epidemics, healing for those who are affected and strength to those who are assisting in the medical profession. Our vision 2020 practice for April is outreach. You can see ways to out to reach out at our service local page. The website, don't forget to email a picture of you serving Pastor Christina at Christina T UNC RightsvilleUNC.org. Our LT focus of the week is Hope Recuperative Care. They give free shelter and food to hospitals, patients who leave the hospital, but do not have a home where they can recover. If you can give a little more, mark your donation. Uh, Hope Recuperative Care. We hope you enjoy our worship service today. Lift up your voice and sing. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. Praise now our God and King. church family. Thank you for giving us comfortable homes, plenty of good food to eat, and water to drink. We pray that you help us to take good care of the earth which you have given us. We also pray for the leaders of our community and world that they will make decisions that honor and take care of your gifts to us. We pray for the medical professionals who are taking care of the people affected by the virus. And we pray for our communities all over the world to stay healthy and safe. We pray for those on our prayer list and those we lift up now in our hearts. Amen. Good morning. My name is Owen Gross and I am in the fourth grade. Please bow your heads and join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, I am Smith Reynolds and I am in the third grade. Today I will be reading our Psalm of the month, which is Psalm 16. Keep me safe, my God, for it, and you take it, take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they, they are the noble ones who run is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out liberations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen from me in pleasant places. Surely, surely I have a delightful inheritance i will praise the lord who consoles me even at night my heart instructs me i keep my eyes always on the lord with him at my right hand i will be, not be shaken therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see de decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, will, with internal pleasures at your right hand. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Wrightsville Methodist. We are glad you're worshiping with us today. I'm Christina Norville, the Director of Children and Youth Ministries at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And these are my two lovely assistants this morning, Virginia Gray and Mavis. Hi. Hi. We certainly miss you guys. We love you. We wish we could all worship together in the sanctuary, and we can't wait to be back together soon. But this is Children's Sabbath, and we are celebrating God's creation today. So for children's sermon this morning, my girls and I are going to be sharing the story of God's creation. So we've got a, some cool props we're going to be using. Um, Mavis, hold up the props. And so if you want to come closer to your TV or your laptop or your smartphone um, so you can see the globes and all that good stuff, but, we'd love um, to have you. Was, um, this is a sign. That's yeah. right. All right, so Virginia Gray is going to open us up with um, a poem that we found about the creation story. The title of this poem is God Made Everything. God made light and day and night. He made the lands and seas, flower trees and things to eat, birds and bumblebees. God made fish and elephants, cats, cats and doggies too. Do you know what else God made? God made me and you. Isn't it wonderful to know God made you and he loves you too? Thank you, Virginia Gray. Mm -hmm. um, so the Norville girls have been spending a lot of time outside during this quarantine. We go on walks, we take bike rides, we even take our shoes off and put our feet in the grass. We have picnics. We've been doing a lot of stuff outside. So it has been- I asked, I'm jogging. Yes, and jogging? No. Oh, and we planted a garden. Yes, thank you, Mavis. So, there are lots of ways to celebrate God's creation um, on Earth Day week. Earth Day was Wednesday, and so I hope you all celebrated Earth Day. But today, for worship, we're all celebrating God's beautiful creation together. So, I'm going to start reading um, 
the story of creation. So Mavis, can you hand the globes to your sister and then you're gonna help me read the book. You're gonna help me read the book. Ready? All right, the first day, ready Mavis? In the beginning, God made heaven and earth. At first it was empty and dark, but God gathered up the light and called it day. Then he gathered up the darkness and called it night. God was watching over everything. Okay. On day two, God divided the air from the water. He put some water above the air and some below it. He named the air sky. On day three, God was busy. He made puddles and oceans and lakes and waterfalls and rivers. He made the dry ground too. Next, he made plants. He made so many different kinds of trees, flowers, and bushes that no one could count them. God said his work was good. On day four, oh, here you can have the taste of On day four, you have day four, Virginia Gray? Yes. All right, hold it up. On day four, God put the sun in the sky to warm the earth. He saw that the night was very dark. So God put the moon and the stars in the sky. Then God made spring, summer, fall, and winter. All that he made was good. Make animals, make animals, and make birds. That's right. So on day five, God made the starfishes, the octopuses, the whales, the turtles. He made fast little fish for rivers and slippery big fish for the ocean. He made big birds like eagles to soar in the sky and zippy little birds like hummingbirds. He made birds in all shapes, sizes, and colors. On the sixth day, God made the animals, puppies, cows, horses, kitties, bears, lizards, mice, worms, and lots more. Everything was good, but something was still missing. There were no people. So God made some, and when he made them, he made them like himself. He made them so they could be friends with him. Virginia Gray, what is in the middle of that globe? What does it say? It says, and me. And like, we went through all of this and then God created you. And God created you. And God created all of you and you and this beautiful earth that we live in. And house. And the house and everything God has given us. I do have a question for you. What did God do on the seventh day? Does anybody know what God did? There's seven days in a week. Um, what did God do on the seventh day after creating rested. everything? Huh? He rested. He rested. rested. He rested. He took a Sabbath. He took a rest. And so one of our hopes is that you have found this quarantine to be a time of rest for you and, and your family. And we hope family. that... You Virginia Gray is going to close us in prayer today. We hope you've enjoyed our children's sermon this morning. We can't wait to see you again in person. All right, are you ready? Yes. For the sun that gives me warmth and light, for, for flowers, trees, and stars at night, for tender care, for hugs and love, we thank you, Father, up above. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Wrightsville. Praise Him, praise Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Praise Him, praise Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. 
Thinking, thinking, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Thinking, thinking, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Good morning. I'm Sadler Selby. It is now time to offer our gifts to God. We need it now more than ever. These are very rough times we are going through, and your donation would mean a lot to us here at Wrightsville UMC. There are three ways that you can donate. You can go online to wrightswellumc.org and press the giving button to donate. You can use the Wrightsville app on your phone, or you can do it the old fashioned way and mail us a check at P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, NC 28480. We thank you so much for your generous donation. Wrightsville UMC will continue to serve as a beacon of light to us all, and I pray that you will continue to feel God's love right now and through these very tough days ahead. I miss you all, and I can't wait to see you soon. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wrightsville United Methodist Church. What a great children's Sabbath we have had already. I want to thank all of the kids who have participated today, who have utilized their gifts and talents in order to help bring worship alive for all of us who are watching worship uh, throughout the Wilmington area and, and even beyond. I'm sure this is going to parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins um, all over the country and perhaps even to places all over the world. Uh, but Again, just want to thank all the kids, want to thank their parents, want to thank the folks that are helping to um, produce all of this for our church, including our director of children and youth, Christina Norville, and her assistant, Pam Hutzel, our director of children's music, Courtney Rickert, uh, the man behind uh, the video for us, Ryan Mansbury, Julia Walker Jewell, who helps with music, so many folks, uh, so many unsung heroes that help to uh, make this come alive each and every week. So uh, thank you so much. Um, I now want to look at today's scripture, which comes from the very beginning of the book. And I mean the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. Well, if you know the story of Genesis chapter 1, it's how God created the heavens and the earth. And he did it one day at a time over the course of seven days. And at the end of each day, God looks at what he has created and he says that he saw that it was good. Well, I wonder if we might use some liberties and think of some other ways of describing something as being good. What are some other synonyms, some other words that we can use to say that something is good? I asked some of the kids what they use in place of the word good, and here's what we came up with. So when I was a kid, um, instead of saying something was good, we might say something was great or wonderful or even awesome. But when we were really proud, we would look at something and we would go, yes. Can you do that with me? Go, yes. All right, so that's what we're going to do. Every time we get to the end of a day, and it says, and God saw that it was good. We're going to say, and God said, and you do it with me, yes. All right? So everybody watching at home, we're going to do that at the end of each day. Here we go. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, yes. 
And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together. He called seas. And God said, yes. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God said. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God said, yes. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God said, yes, God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God said, yes. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the whole earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and indeed said, Yes! Yes! yes. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Then the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he'd done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he'd done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The first car I ever bought with my own hard work and money was a beautiful candy apple red used, excuse me, pre-owned five-speed Isuzu Rodeo. You remember these cars? They were kind of a, a less expensive model than the Ford Explorer or the Jeep Grand Cherokee. It was an early SUV, and I loved this car. Now, in general, the rodeo didn't have the greatest track record when it came to maintenance issues, but I never had a problem with mine. I took good care of it. 
I kept the oil changed regularly. I had the tires rotated properly. I never took it off road. And instead, I bought a CD player that I had installed in the car and I drove that little red rodeo around everywhere. Put 200,000 miles on it. Now, it was bigger than most cars. Like I said, it was an SUV. In fact, if you put the back seat down, you could use it sort of like a truck to haul things around. And with that in mind, a friend asked if he could borrow it one day to move some furniture. I said, sure, after all, this was my friend. Whatever you need. Uh, we'll just switch vehicles for the weekend. I didn't really have any place to go anyway, so no big deal. Except... When I got my precious red rodeo back, I noticed that the gas gauge was empty. And I thought, really? And then I noticed that the radio presets had been changed. And I thought, now that takes some nerve. And then I found surface scratches on the rear quarter panel and on the tailgate. At which point I thought, you've got to be kidding me. To say I was disappointed was an understatement. But most of my disappointment was because someone who called themselves my friend showed such total disregard for my property. Now, you all know that in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God asked us to take care of the earth. He said, I still own it. I'm just asking you to take care of it for me. In fact, Psalm 24 puts it this way. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The oceans, the forests, the hills, the plains, the rivers, the lakes, all of it. It all belongs to God. You know the old hymn, this is my father's world. Well, in the early chapters of Genesis, God gave instructions as to how we're supposed to take care of his world. There are really four key instructions that he delivered. He said that he wanted us to subdue it, to rule over it, to work it, and take care of it. So what does God mean when he says subdue the earth? Well, a long time ago in a church far, far away, I was finishing up a Sunday service and walking to the back of the church to greet everyone when the service ended. Now, the ushers had been instructed to keep the doors shut until the choir finished singing their final song after the benediction. Except on this occasion, a man was eager to beat the rush of the crowd in order to get to lunch. So he got up out of his seat and he headed for the door. Following the rules, the usher would not open the door for him because the choir hadn't finished singing. The first man got upset. The usher got defensive. I was at the back of the church, just a few feet away, watching this whole scene take place. They were yelling at each other through whispers, in a way trying not to disturb everybody else around them. But then the choir suddenly finished, and the debate at the back of the church did not. The first man raised his voice way above a whisper, and he got Toes to toes and nose to nose with the stubborn usher. So I quickly jumped in between the two of them, put my hand on the shoulder of the first man who got up in the first place, and I asked him to take a closer walk with me. Now, I didn't manhandle the man. I didn't physically restrain him. I didn't sit on him or handcuff him, taser him, or even threaten him in any way. I didn't mistreat him at all. All I did was take a minute to bring him back into conformity with the expected behavioral standards of being at church. Or, well, the expected behavioral standards of being anywhere, for that matter. I just calmed him down. I subdued him. He was generally a very nice man. He was extremely embarrassed, very apologetic, still mad at the usher, but he knew better than to act that way toward him. That's what the imperative in Genesis is. God says that whatever gets unruly, if vines overgrow the pathways, if trees require trimming, that stuff should be subdued, brought under control. Next, we're told to rule over the earth. 
Some translations say to have dominion over the earth. To rule over it connotes having authority over it. Parents are told in Scripture to rule over their children, which simply means they're to bring them into orderliness. They're to provide them with safety and they're to develop them consistently over a long period of time, helping them to grow up and be productive members of society. The New Testament also says, though, parents don't provoke your children, meaning you better not rule over your kids in an abusive way. You'll incite rebellion. They may hate you. It's the same kind of idea here. We're to have authority over the earth, but not in an abusive kind of way. The next phrase says we're to work it. For any of you who have gardens, you know that if you're going to grow stuff, if it's going to yield produce, you got to work the garden. You got to till it. You got to plow up the ground. You got to seed it. You got to weed it. You got to water it. You got to work it. Then it'll bear fruit. That's the sense of that. The fourth instruction is to take care of it. And the sense of this word is to keep it safe. Uh, more than that is to protect it from any kind of harm. Don't let bad stuff happen to it. So th these are the four key instructions to subdue it, rule over it, work it, take care of it. Don't let anything nasty happen to this world that God's entrusting to us. The earth is whose? The Lord's. This is my father's world. Now, beyond Genesis, there are some pretty cool things that continue to happen throughout the Bible, but it isn't the kind of stuff that we tend to cover in Sunday school lessons. Like in Exodus chapter 26, where God rebukes his people for not resting the land that they were farming. He accuses them of soil abuse, which is what they were doing. God had established rhythms of how the land was supposed to be used. Land, by his decree, should lie fallow every once in a while and get rested and refurbished and then farmed again. But God's people said, no, nope, we want to work it the way we want to work it and we'll just do what we want and we're not going to rest it appropriately. God went after them and said, no, you rest my land. No soil abuse. In Deuteronomy 20, God instructs soldiers not to damage the fruit trees when they're attacking an enemy city. God says, those are my trees. I gave them to you so that you could eat from them. Whatever skirmishes you're having down there, it isn't the fruit tree's fault. If you want to rough up each other, that's one thing. Just don't mess with my trees, which is kind of an interesting passage. In Proverbs 12, 10, God instructs the righteous who own animals to treat them respectfully as well. So there should be no soil abuse, no tree abuse, no animal abuse. God says, everything in my creation is mine. I want you to treat it respectfully. Subdue it, rule over it, work it, but protect it and take care of it. No abuse allowed. Now, with all those biblical mandates to take care of the earth, and there are many more, I've never understood why Christians have been so slow to get on the environmental bandwagon. We should have been at the front of the line to promote care for God's creation. But let's push this all a little further. Romans 1.20 says the power and beauty of God's creation is exhibit A to whom? To atheists, to people who don't believe in God. The text says any logical, honest person who beholds the heavens and the earth has to conclude that there was an intelligent, powerful creator behind it all. The text says people would have to lie to themselves to say there wasn't a powerful, intelligent creator who did all this. Creation itself is a powerful witness. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. In my neighborhood, we have a fun little ritual. It could happen on just about any day, but especially so on warm, sunny days. You see, we have this park. It's just a few hundred yards beyond this church right here. Um, and it looks west, back across the water, back toward Wilmington. And on warm, sunny days, people will gather in this park to watch the sunset. Sometimes there will be several dozen people who will gather there just to watch God paint the sky. It's so beautiful. 
Nature often draws us closer to God. Many summers ago, when I was at Camp Chestnut Ridge, I was leading the day campers in an afternoon of canoeing. I was sitting alone in a canoe with a little six-year-old boy who looked out at the trees that surrounded the lake, and he said to me, tell me about God. He was just that direct. He had been inspired by the scenery. I think God knows that some of us need to be in the context of his creation in order to quiet ourselves enough to really open up to him, to be chilled out, to be tranquil enough for times of spiritual reflection and to maybe, just maybe, hear his voice a little more clearly. Think back over your own life. How many of you can think of a time when you were in a forest or in the mountains or maybe walking along the beach? Maybe it was out under the stars or watching a beautiful sunrise and you had some kind of defining moment with God or or a moment of deep meaning because you were in nature. Yeah, I bet a lot of you have. Yet things happen powerfully when we go into the beauty of God's creation. I wonder if that stuff would still happen if you were standing next to a toxic waste dump or beside a polluted river. Some of our best writers and best communicators and poets have been motivated when they were in the presence of God in nature. See where I'm going with this? Creation itself does powerful things to those of us who know God. Y'all know I recently went to the Holy Land and I've mentioned before that the northern section of Israel around the Sea of Galilee is a beautiful place with lush, green, rolling hills full of all kinds of fruit trees. When Jesus wanted to get away from the crowds and pray, he would go up into these mountains or find some quiet place in nature. When he was in his father's world, he could relate to his father more closely. So God's creative realm has intrinsic value, but it also adds value to our lives in some unexpected ways. It sets the context for these defining moments. It calms our spirits. It stimulates creativity. It even increases our faith. We understand why God values nature. So let's ask ourselves the question that I think has to be asked. Are we, in fact, subduing, ruling over, working and taking care of the creative realm in the way that God had in mind when he first gave us these instructions? Would we give ourselves an A, B, C, D or F grade when it comes to creation care? Let's be honest about a few things. Do you know that about a third of the earth's soil is now unfit for growing food? because of the overuse of fertilizers and waste disposal procedures, soil abuse. Do you know that rainforests once covered 14% of the earth and they are key to the entire global ecosystem, but now have been reduced to just 6% of the earth and that the number goes down every year? Tree abuse. Did you know that every year more oceans, rivers, lakes, and streams are polluted, compromising the drinking water of up to 2 billion people around the world? In fact, we've had our own issues with this right here on the Cape Fear. Water abuse. On balance, it would be tough, in my view, to give our generation a straight A for how we've been stewards of the planet. But I am happy to say that there is a groundswell of people all around the world who think our father's world deserves better. Through their efforts, in large part, the awareness level of the average American is going up and up and up. And we've seen a lot of changes in the last few decades. Some of us can remember very clearly the days when automobiles had no pollution controls and they spewed so much pollution out of their exhaust pipes. That's gotten a little better over the years. And so has the average gas mileage for cars, too. Some of us are old enough to remember when nobody did home recycling or composting. Uh, that, That would have been seen as very strange. That's gotten a lot better over the years. Some of us remember the days when people not only burned their leaves at the edge of their driveway, some people even burned their garbage. That's changed, and that's good. So there's been a groundswell of people who are saying, we've got to turn this thing around. 
Some are motivated by spiritual values and some just understand intellectually you can't continue to abuse the place where you live. It's the only planet we have. So some are really motivated by God and some are just motivated by good old common sense and a true concern for the earth. These days, these groups are starting to get together and some interesting changes are taking place. There's a lot of people going green these days and I'm really hoping that some of us motivated by God, this is our father's world after all, will begin to make some different choices. For instance, most of us know to separate our recyclables from the rest of our trash, but we could really reduce the amount of plastic we use in the first place by using reusable grocery bags and reusable water bottles. Americans throw away 35 billion plastic water bottles each year. 35 billion. Some estimate that it'll take a thousand years for those plastic bottles to decompose. So they just sit in our landfills and fill up our oceans. A few years ago, I was fortunate enough to go to a student environmental conference in Costa Rica with one of my children. And there we got to hear from Jane Goodall, who is famous for her work with chimpanzees and one of the world's leading conservationists. At that conference, I learned something that some of you already knew, but, but I did not. And that's just how much the consumption of animals, particularly beef, is contributing to environmental damage. Here's the thing. Riding your bike to work, taking shorter showers, switching to LED light bulbs are all helpful. But they don't even come close to making as big an impact on the environment as our food does. The methane from cows contributes to greenhouse gases and their waste often contaminates our water supplies. Now in Southeast North Carolina, we see it more often with hogs and turkeys and chickens than with cows, especially whenever there's a big flood from a hurricane. But this is a problem around much of the world. Did you know that if everyone in America gave up meat just one day a week, we'd save 100 billion gallons of water? or enough to supply all the homes in North and South Carolina together for the next four months. We would also save 1.5 billion pounds of crops that otherwise are fed to livestock, or enough to feed the entire state of West Virginia for a year. We would save 70 million gallons of gas, which is enough to fuel all the cars of Canada and Mexico combined. And that's just the effect of one day. Look, I don't want to point the finger at farmers and ranchers at all. We need to simply re-examine what we're asking for as consumers. Because the demands we're making on the world's agricultural system simply aren't sustainable for the next 50 years. Now, unfortunately, I'm not ready to become a strict vegetarian just yet. But I think I could do it once a week to protect the planet, to protect my father's world to give my children's children the same amount of clean air, clean water, and other natural resources that you and I have. Let's start tomorrow, and then try it again the next Monday. Meatless Mondays, okay? We can do this just once a week, once a week. Which brings me to say my closing thoughts. And it's a challenging one, I I'm gonna forewarn you. You see, the poor really suffer when those of us in the developed world get careless with our energy consumption and pollution. When we consume a lot of energy, it drives prices up all over the world. And when the poor get to the point where they can no longer afford energy at the price where it comes to them, then they go outside and they cut down the trees. They cut down trees not to build homes, they cut down trees for cooking and to keep themselves warm at night. If you've ever been to Haiti, you'll see that nearly the entire country has been deforested. It has destroyed their country. And this happens all over the world. The poor, if they're downstream from a factory that's polluting their rivers, they just keep drinking out of the rivers because they don't have large purification plants like we do and they can't afford to dig wells or buy bottled water. So they drink the water and they develop diseases because some factory upstream is polluting the river. I'm ashamed that it's, to say that it has taken me so long to line up all the dots, but I've realized, wait a minute, 
I not only have a stewardship responsibility for creation care of this wonderful world that God created, but every energy decision I make in my beautiful corner of the world will eventually have an effect on the poor in another part of my father's world. That's starting to have an impact on me. I don't think there's any need to run out to our driveways and see who's driving the biggest gas guzzlers. That's not the spirit of this. We don't have to visit each other's homes and see where everybody's got their thermostat set. No. But this is our father's world. It matters that we are stewards of it. And it certainly matters to the poor. So let's take care of it because we're Christian and God said so. Let's do our part to protect our beautiful beaches, our rivers, our forests, our lakes, the fish that live in the sea, the birds that fly in the air and every creepy crawly thing that walks along the ground. Let's do it for our kids and our grandkids and their grandkids. Most of all, let's do it for God. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand, the wonders wrought. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Boy, God gave us an awesome responsibility, didn't he? To take care of the world that he created. Well, I think as we go out this week, let's enjoy the beauty of God's creation. But let's also think of how we might be better stewards of it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>